Hello, everyone. I'm Ryan Heath, author of Politico's Global Insider Newsletter and podcast of the same name. And we're now here to talk about vote manipulation, which is, of course, as old as electoral processes themselves, but it's often misunderstood or deliberately misconveyed as a concept. There was not, for example, any widespread successful voter fraud at the 2020 US presidential election, though there were many efforts to otherwise disrupt that election. But overall, that election was fairly resilient and secure. Globally, in today's digitized information environment, would-be autocrats are learning tactics from each other. The bad actors have more ways to copy and spread and scale up those tactics. And so in this next half hour, we're here to test what the 21st century authoritarian handbook for vote manipulation looks like and what we've learned about combating those methods around the world. I'd now like to introduce our three fantastic panelists. Ingeborg Gisladotter, who is Deputy Special Representative for Political Affairs and Electoral Assistance at the United Nations Assistant Mission, Assistance Mission for Iraq. Zach Beecham is Senior Correspondent at Vox. And Gulalai Ismail is Human Rights Activist and a Corbell graduate student. Welcome to each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Happy to be here. Great. Uh, Ingeborg, maybe let's kick off with you. Um, obviously, you're now working on Iraq, but before that, you've led the OSCE's electoral observation mission in Ukraine. You've been in Turkey and Afghanistan. All of these countries have had huge democratic highs and lows over the last couple of decades. Tell us a bit about your experience, about how much of a common thread there is around those challenges and how much each country faces unique and specific uh, challenges when it comes to their elections. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you forgot to mention that I was also in Belarus and, and Kazakhstan. So and foreign minister of Iceland. It is the yeah, CV but if as long as talking about arms. authoritarian uh, uh, regimes, uh, then I, I think, you know, it's important to look at countries like Belarus, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, and uh, when we look at these countries, and Turkey for that matter, they all have their specificities, but there are a lot of things they have in common. Some of these countries have actually been able to organize uh, fairly good elections. Where you are, when you see the voting and the counting, there is not, you know, frauds, any obvious frauds, and they are do it in quite a professional and transparent manner. So the the election day is is fine, but they they it's what happens before election day that is uh, where where that you know kicks in the manipulation of the elections. And there we see a lot of common, common threats. Of course, you know, there's a disregard for fundamental uh, freedoms of assembly, association and expression. There is a systematic uh, harassment and uh, criminal uh, prosecution of uh, opposition. Uh, we see legal restrictions on the right of, uh, to stand, obstacle to political parties to, to register. Uh, candidates are accused of criminal uh, offense and denied, therefore, the right to stand. Journalists and bloggers are harassed and and uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, have problems to 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 and and subject to arbitrary arrest and detention. These are the things that we see and which are quite common in all all these countries. So the, the, the thing is that they, in the beginning of the 19s, when we thought liberal democratic values were, were winning and they were being taken up by the uh, former Soviet bloc, uh, they had a lot of fraudulent activities on election day, but then they learned you know, how to, to do these things without you know, being uh, uh, seen as uh, uh, that the elections were marked. Being less obvious. Yeah. To, to not be so obvious. So I think they have learned how to deal with this before election day. And that's kind of the, the common knowledge that they probably, you know, learn from each other. Um, Zach, if I can turn to you now, the US is so often a test bed for democratic and campaign innovations that just later spread across the world. I know you take the view that the Republican Party is still dominated by Trump and by election fraud fantasies. So I guess I have a twofold question. 
one, how well organized are these domestic election uh, subversion efforts? And then two, how well connected are those efforts and those activists to other movements that are trying to sow distrust uh, in other Western democracies? So I think I would take a, a sort of before 2020 and after 2020 lens on answering this question. Because before 2020, there was very little, I, I would think, systematic efforts to subvert US elections. And I use that term deliberately because election subversion is a distinct category of offenses from election manipulation or, so, or voter suppression. You know, that is to say, trying to rig the election before it starts by through tools like gerrymandering or uh, voter ID laws that disenfranchise certain groups. Those tactics are less effective and less threatening than voter than election subversion, as far as I can tell, which is an effort to use the law to outright overturn the will of the voters after it's done, throw out legitimate ballots on false pretexts, that kind of thing. That was done in a, in a very ad hoc way in the 2020 election. The Trump people didn't really have a good plan in place for how they were going to try to overturn the election. They tried all sorts of different things. Uh, none of them really got off the ground very well. That's sort of why you ended up with January 6th. Uh, and why you ended up with it with an actual violent movement on the day that the votes were finally were being finalized, basically. After 2020, uh, things are quite different, right? You've started to see efforts at not only organization in uh, among anti-democratic factions of the Republican Party around the idea that the election was fraudulent, which vast majorities of Republican voters still say they believe. Right, so that's, that's clearly the dominant position in the party. Uh, but you've also seen um, an escalation in certain kinds of tactics, right? So state legislatures have become considering, considering uh, more aggressive laws to interfere with the voting process. The most notable one here is Georgia's law, which allows for the state legislator to take over local voting counting procedures, essentially opening the door for partisan interference in the, the process of tallying. Uh, which is, I think, one of the most disturbing laws that's been passed in the country. But even more aggressive ones have been proposed in states like Arizona that would allow them to, the state legislature, again, to overturn the will of the voters, right? To just say, no, we're appointing our own set of electors to the electoral college and basically trying to pick the state, the state's choice for president on our own. Uh, and then, you you know, you have a, a massive, I think, clearly coordinated through uh, certain different mechanisms, wave of Republican activists getting involved at the very local level of people running for local These are people campaigning jobs. now to run the election process, for example. Correct, yeah. Uh, and there, you know, you've seen massive upticks with, without any parallel on the Democratic side. And normally you'd think that's a good thing, right? It is good for more citizens and individuals to get involved in democracy. But a lot of these people tend to be people who deeply believe that the election was stolen and it creates this weird situation where a false belief that the election was stolen is creating the risk of an actual election theft by the people who claim to oppose election theft. It's, it's, it's almost difficult to wrap your head around that this is the motivation. You're also seeing state secretary of state candidates who uh, forming a formal alliance. That, you know, these are people who are in charge of election administration at the state level, literally forming a formal alliance of people who believe the election was stolen and want to change the system in certain unspecified ways to favor the GOP and their candidates or to stop what they would call voter fraud. Um, and, and what's notable about this, in addition to the, the threat it poses to the integrity of American elections, is the degree to which there are starting to develop open affinities with anti-democratic leaders abroad. Right, so they will they they will deny that this is anti democratic. It's part of the sort of game that elected authoritarians play in in all sorts of different countries, right? But they say we are the ones who are actually protecting democracy while they are doing things that undermine it. So I think the strongest affinity between the American sort of we have to kill democracy to save it types and any kind of foreign leaders abroad is clearly hunger. Right. So you'll see in the run up to the Hungarian election, uh, which is on April 3rd, there are two separate conferences happening in Europe that are sponsored by American right wing groups. One of them is in Brussels and then the next one's in Budapest. CPAC, right, the flagship gathering of the American conservative movement, is holding an offshoot branch just before the Hungarian election, like a little more than a week before in the Hungarian capital. And that to me is a real sign of a sort of growing affinity, if not like direct copying of tactics, at least of Americans copying Hungarian tactics. I believe there's some evidence that Hungarians are copying American tactics or have in the past, but not the other way around yet. 
Um, so it, there's a, an emerging movement on the international level, but on the domestic level, it's very clearly established. Yeah, I was about to say excellent, but that's the wrong way to react to that information. <laughs> Thank you. I think it was the correct word. Um, Gulalai, uh, how much does this, how familiar does this sound to you in the Pakistani context? Um, what are the most common, most successful vote manipulation tactics that you've seen in Pakistan? Um, all of the tactics that have been shared are very popular, very common in Pakistan. In Pakistani context, we often refer uh, to the term as political engineering when we talk of vote, vote manipulation or managing elections. Uh, if you look at the history of Pakistan, in the past 70 years of Pakistan, Pakistan has uh, alternated between quasi-democracy and pure democracy rule. Uh, but over the past uh, decade, Pakistan had witnessed democracy at its most undiluted form. Um, and now the threat is not from direct military coup, but from creeping coup. Like in the past, the military establishment would use, would, would either like direct stage a coup or use special powers to sack an elected government. Now they have learned that it can lead to, of course, sanctions and it can lead to uh, difficulties at the international stage. So now they have, they have started using all other means to manipulate elections, to do political engineering. And and the political parties also have learned the lesson that to uh, that to win elections and to form a government, they have to appease the military establishment. And when I say military establishment, it means the top brass of Pakistan army and the intelligence agencies of Pakistan. So they have learned the political parties that they are the right people to appease. So elections have kind of become a musical chair game where uh, which is controlled by the military establishment. And what are some of the major tactics that are used by the powerful military establishment of, of Pakistan is number one, the judiciary military nexus. That is the judicial persecution of, uh, uh, of popular politicians, the unfavored politicians. For example, we have seen in Pakistan that even the elected prime ministers have been, while they were serving their terms, they were uh, declared as ineligible and they were removed from their positions. Uh, a former judge, actually recently, a former judge of Islam, Islamabad High Court, he came public and he, and he accused intelligence agencies of micromanaging the courts in Pakistan so that certain politicians can be kept in prison uh, and they can not be let out to uh, kind of take part in uh, either election campaigning or even to declare them ineligible. Uh, and we have also seen that uh, hundreds of, like in the last, last general elections in Pakistan were in 2018. In the whole history of Pakistan, Pakistan has only witnessed three elections and two peaceful transitions. Uh, um, and we witnessed that hundreds of political workers of unfavored political parties were actually arrested to, uh, to, to damage or to control the election campaigning. But the other severe, be, beside this very strong judiciary and military nexus, what we have seen, which is extremely dangerous, is actually uh, letting militant proscribed militant organizations to run for elections they were either facilitated to run for elections or they were kind of uh, just let free uh, and the purpose was to divide the vote bank of popular political parties uh, for example uh, in last elections we saw that pakistan removed uh, uh, a terrorist a sectarian uh, a sectarian terrorist whose whose name was molana mohammed ahmed ludianwi who was involved in sectarian terrorist activities he was removed from watch list and he was free to he was given a free ground to do election campaigning, to contest elections under a different name of a different political party. Another terrorist, Hafiz Saeed, who is on a UN terror blacklist, uh, on a UN terror list, uh, because he, he is allegedly involved in the Mumbai attacks in India, which killed 166 people in 2008. He was led to run elections through the, name, through the banner of a different political party. So many terrorists, like hundreds of people were running for elections uh, um, uh, um, from the platform of those militant organizations. So the purpose was to divide the vote bank, but in the process, it just didn't divide the vote bank of the most popular political parties. It also increased religious militancy in the country. Um, freedom of movement is curbed. This is a very uh, uh, kind of classical tactic in Pakistan that the uh, freedom of movement of certain politicians will be restricted. There will be they will be house arrested 
and they will not be let they, they are not allowed to take part in election campaigning so on one hand the secular or popular political uh, activists or candidates would be put under restrictions and on the other hand terrorists or militants will be given a free hand to uh, to do election campaigning uh, in the previous elections what we saw was extremely dangerous was military given a large role in administrating the voting process more than um, 3 million uh, sorry 0 0.3 million uh, military um, Troops were actually deployed on the election day to administer the elections. And in a country like Pakistan, where the military establishment is accused of uh, political engineering, of course, that uh, was seen as uh, uh, a, an attack on the free elections. Uh, but uh, and then the uh, other one, which we had already talked about, is controlling perceptions through media. We have seen in the uh, in the last decade that uh, free medium free um, uh, media freedoms have been curbed. Um, journalists were abducted. They had they faced arbitrary detentions. Uh, certain newspapers they were their hawkers were not allowed to distribute. Uh, certain newspapers for months newspapers were not allowed to be distributed so that the public perception can be managed uh, tv uh, tv channels were the cable operators were told to take off air certain tv channels and the even they were um, blackmailed through financial controls like uh, advertisements won't be given to them Adver advertising companies were asked by the military establishment not to give advertisement to certain TV channels to kind of bring them on knees so there was a journalist has been facing harassment and uh, it was uh, Amnesty International also, um, of course, they also, um, uh, they, they had also serious allegations about the arbitrary detentions and restrictions on the media. Social media was, you know, and when uh, when most of the journalists uh, who were neutral, they, they, they lost their jobs before the elections, before, because if they were not willing to do the propaganda of the military establishment, the TV channels were forced to uh, remove them from their jobs. And of course, the digital disinformation also now plays a very important role. Uh, so social media and traditional media both were used to spread disinformation around, uh, to spread disinformation about certain pol politicians which were unfavored. Uh, and then also, of course, all those tactics which have already been mentioned, like censor, like censors just before the elections and uh, uh, gerrymandering, um, capturing political booths that it was also very common though now the election now an now extremely it's... comprehensive set of threats that you're facing in Pakistan yes exactly yep. so um like, yes sorry go on yeah like I, I was saying that that now you will not see like you won't expect election day rigging <clears throat> nowadays but in recent by elections we saw that 20 presiding officers disappeared all of a sudden in a by-elections and they remained disappeared for six hours to manipulate vote counting. So though we don't expect it to happen, but sometimes even that happened in Pakistan now. That is that is a lot to absorb. Uh, thank you for sharing all of that. I Definitely what comes across in each of your answers is that uh, the administration of elections uh, really matters. And there are a lot of touch points where it can go wrong if you want to manipulate um, those roles. Uh, I wanted to bring in an audience question. Um, and it's, so to each of you, um, George from Kamba Kampala in Uganda asks, how can we boost democracy and protect voting rights in the least developed countries? Uh, it's been a while since we heard from you, Ingeborg. I'll turn back to you. How can we what? Uh, How can we boost democracy and protect voting rights in the least developed countries? Oh, that's uh, <laughs> it's maybe difficult for me to to answer because I have not been working in these least developed countries. I've been working mm -hmm. mainly in in uh, Europe and Central Asia, eastern part of Europe and, and Central Asia, which are quite uh, developed countries. But the thing is, and what's important to have in mind, that you could have elections without you know having a genuine democracy you cannot have democracy without elections but you can have elections without having genuine uh, democracy so elections and the right to vote is not uh, the only thing to 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 aim for it is really important that the, the right to vote and uh, organizing proper election goes hand in hand 
with uh, the uh, uh, fundamental freedoms of assembly, of association, of expression, because without these fundamental freedoms, the elections are kind of uh, meaningless. So this has to be ensured that this goes hand in hand. Um, Zach, is there any lesson that sometimes feels like the US uh, is not the most developed country itself? There's such an uneven experience within the US, um, but is there anything um, from those varied experiences that you think um, can be applied to assist the situation in the least developed countries? Uh, the experience from uh, these countries in Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia yeah, I think, you know, what is important is to actually, and that because we talked about election administration, it is really important to have um, in, uh, that election uh, administration that is not uh, partial, that is not taking a stand, that is professional. I think that is uh, one of the most important things, and that we saw here in Iraq in the last elections, which made a huge difference not to have a politically... Uh, uh, shall we say, motivated or uh, selected election administration. Because I think that's the way we, we, first we have to try to organize election day in a proper manner, but it has to go hand in hand with other things. And, and the election day will not be proper without a, a proper election administration. I, I would add to that, uh, based on the historical American experience, not as much the contemporary one, that uh, the United States had a problem, a significant problem, one that collapsed democracy in parts of it with electoral violence. Uh, we don't remember this nearly so well most of the time because uh, the U.S. is held up as this paragon of democracy. But after the Civil War, the Confederacy and the former elements of the Confederacy formed a kind of insurgency in the South designed to prevent African Americans from exercising the right to franchise. And there was significant violence directed both at Blacks and white Republicans who were attempting to stand up a multiracial democratic regime in those countries, often with the tacit approval of, uh, of vast swaths of the population there. Uh, the lesson I take from that is that, that, that's I think relevant to a lot of developing countries today, is that it's vitally important to have state security services that are not adjuncts to one particular political faction, just as important in some cases as electoral administration itself. If the security forces can be expected yeah. to crack down on violent factions and can take violence aimed at intimidating voters seriously and do direct deal with threats emanating from all sides of the political spectrum, it's much more likely for a democracy to survive in a fragile environment. The lesson that we had from the US in the 1860s and 70s is that when there's an inability by authorities to deal with these violent factions, they can often succeed in accomplishing their goals of, of, of essentially making elections hollowed out and meaningless, even if they don't succeed at formally overthrowing the regime that they're challenging or toppling the central government. I agree with you that the security is key, but that has not only to do with, with the military, because if there are a lot of uncontrolled weapons, a lot of militias, that can also be a major threat to the, Absolutely. the Absolutely. process. So that also has to be under control. And security is a key issue for elections. Yes, uh, and especially hello. in countries like Pakistan, like when where you have where we know that military are deploying troops would mean unfair elections, and it can mean that some political one political party will be favored over the other. So coming from a least developing country, one of uh, my lesson is that uh, one of our lesson is that to for free and fair elections, uh, what is needed is for the political parties to build alliances and to come together against the non-democratic forces. That is really vital to not kind of like fall into, like not fall into prey and not um, try to appease the non-democratic forces, but instead build alliances with each other. That is very important. And the other, other lesson that we have learned is to have legal um, infrastructures or legal systems in place which can prevent voter manipulation. For example, in Pakistan for a very long time, it was very common for political parties, for the local elites to come together and they would sign agreements which would say that women, because of the tribal customs or religious customs, women in this specific constituency will not vote. And everyone would agree and women would not be allowed to vote. But now, but because of the advocacy of rights group, a few years ago, Pakistan actually passed laws which now uh, prohibit kind of like women from uh, ban well, 
a ban on women votes. And uh, now if there is in any constituency, if the total number of voter turnout, female voter turnout is less than 10%, then those elections are considered null and void and elections have to be reorganized. So that is kind of like one system that had been uh, put in place. Another system that had been put in place by Pakistan uh, for, after learning from its lesson is that making sure that there is like a form, we call it form 45, uh, and uh, which has to be, it is kind of like a, a vote, uh, vote, voting count for, form and political agents of all political parties are supposed to sign that form. And if that form is not signed, it means that that uh, election in that constituency or the, um, uh, the, the voting count was uh, manipulated. So I think there are like different systems that can be put in place but the most important i think is the uh, alliance of political uh, parties to come together um, and stand against the non-democratic forces i want to briefly pick up on that point just um, in the last couple of minutes of our discussion uh, in some ways we may be able to see um, a range of different um, elections from hungary where you see uh, a coalition candidate um, that sort of, you know, after 10 years of Viktor Orban hijacking uh, and, and, and manipulating to various degrees the institutions of Hungary, the opposition parties are finally coming together to have a coalition candidate. Joe Biden, in some ways, was the coalition candidate against Trump, someone who didn't have a, a huge base or surge of popularity within his own party, but was, you know, kind of least offensive to the largest group of people and, and was able to, to win the election on that basis. Um, I know that's going into sort of political tactics now. So don't don't answer if you don't feel comfortable answering. Um, but is that where we're headed now, where in order to protect democracy, we're going to have to think beyond these old party labels and systems to stop the people who are trying to hijack democracy? Well. I think it's a simple and objective fact that in a lot of, especially Western Europe and in the United States, there's a lot of decay in public faith in the mainstream political parties. Uh, this turns, I guess, in, in other parts of Europe as well, but in a lot of the old established democracies, there are exceptions. So uh, despite the trucker protest in Canada, for example, there's the mainstream consensus and faith in established parties is surprisingly high there. Um, and so again, there's, there's significant variation inside democracies, one that often correlates to the nature of threat to democracy, uh, which is not a surprise, right? When people have more faith in mainstream parties, there's less likely to be support for anti-democratic factions. So this speaks to your, your question about coalition, I think, in two ways, right? Like first, when you have a situation of widespread public mistrust you are, or, or hostility towards the political system or fundamental polarization over issues, you really are forced into the situation where there's uh, an anti-democratic side and a democratic side. So like, to me, the paradigmatic example of this is not the United States or, or Hungary, but actually Israel, which currently has a coalition government of parties that range from the far right to the far left, basically, of the Israeli political spectrum, united only by their shared belief that the government, the right-wing government that uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu led for many years prior to this, had become a threat to democracy in their country, or at least a threat to their own ability to participate fairly and to uh, keep the system non-corrupt. So they, come, they came up with some kind of weird alliance, and Israeli democracy has tremendous problems, not the least of which is the occupation, but this was, and the formation of this coalition was to me an example of exactly the type of approach you're describing in practice. But that's when a system is suffering a severe democratic threat, right, like in Hungary or in the United States. Uh, in other countries, Germany here is a good example, I think, you have the ability of mainstream parties to... Uh, they don't need to form like an everyone agrees on being pro-democracy coalition because the anti-democratic, even anti-democratic is sort of a stretch for AFD, the far right party there, right? The, the party that presents a challenge to liberal values, I would say, represents only a fringe of voters. And so you can impose a, like a cordon sanitaire that is sort of the traditional tactic used in a lot of parliamentary democracies that basically allows, uh, is an agreement not for everybody to unite in one big coalition, but simply to say, we won't form a government with the support of this far right faction. And that tactic has been around for a very long time and is highly effective when in, in fragmented parliamentary systems, when the, the anti-democratic faction only has a sort of, uh, you know, 10, 20% of voter support. In other countries, it's, it's a very, very different situation. Um, Ingeborg, we have uh, about a minute for any final thought from you. 
Well, uh, no, I, I think, you know, we what we have seen in some countries that if there is an, an authoritarian uh, regime or government, uh, president, whatever you have, uh, then often the, the way to go about it is, you know, to try to f establish a, a broad coalition uh, from even from left to, to, to right over the center uh, seems to be, you know, uh, that the, the, what many of these uh, political players try to do, because you have to, you are in a polarized country, you have to come up with something that can appeal to, to the majority of, of the people. Thank you so much. I want to apologize to Richard from Accra and Tom from Denver. We didn't get to your questions, um, but Zach, Ingeborg, Gulalai, thank you so much for your contribution today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.